Sejam muito bem-vindos ao canal Leandro Júnior lá do Deserto. Hoje é um vídeo diferente, é, tão diferente que eu vim até de preto, né? <risos> que eu sempre faço blusa, é, é, vídeos né, com, com a blusa amarela, que é a cor do nosso canal aqui, o amarelo, e é a rosa do deserto que eu acho mais bonita é o amarelo. Enfim, hoje pessoal, um vídeo diferente, 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 diferente. Por quê? Eu resolvi trazer aqui um vídeo do Mark Dimit. Mark Dimit, para quem não sabe, é um botânico estudioso né, das plantas. Ele tem é, uns blogs e tudo. O Mark Dimit é das antigas e ele que escreveu o livro né, Adênio, Escultural, Elegance, é, que é o livro mais conhecido né, no mundo sobre rosas do deserto. Ele sabe a história da rosa do deserto, como foram as primeiras as primeiras plantas que nasceram, né, e, e essa história que eu venho trazer para vocês é muito interessante, tá, é um vídeo para ser visto mais de uma vez, duas, eu assisti umas três vezes para conseguir captar, que eu coloquei nas, na tradução, né, mas para que você não tenha esse trabalho, eu gravei a tela do computador, eu gravei a tela já com a tradução embaixo, mas como a tradução é do próprio Google, não é essas coisas todas. Né? Então, prestem atenção, saibam é, interpretar né, a tradução ali e tal. Então assistam várias vezes esse vídeo para que você... Assim, para quem é estudioso, para quem é louco por Rosa do Deserto, para quem quer entender a história da Rosa do Deserto. Só para vocês terem uma ideia, contar uma historinha aqui rapidinho, que não está lá no vídeo, mas que eu vi em, no blog, né? O... Mark Dimit, quando ficou sabendo da Rosa do Deserto branca, ele viajou dos Estados Unidos, que ele mora lá no Texas, né, até a Taiwan, até Taiwan. Taiwan é um país, né, é, próximo à China. Lá eles falam chinês. Imagina aí, ele viajou, né, de, dos Estados Unidos para Taiwan só para conseguir uma Rosa do Deserto branca, pessoal. Pasmem. Então naquela época não tinha. É, essas variedades todas, elas foram através de várias polinizações, foram aparecendo, aí quando apareceu a primeira dobrada, todo mundo ficou doido, depois apareceu a tripla, e aí vai, aí de tantas polinizações, produtores, eles chamam de hibridizadores, que o que é uma planta híbrida? É quando você coloca um pólen de uma, de uma planta, de uma espécie em outra, em outra espécie, tá? Por exemplo, um crispum com um obeso, poliniza sai aquela planta híbrida e foi através das hibridizações né é, fazendo várias e várias plantas híbridas que foram aparecendo né as novas formatos novas cores novas pétalas dobradas triplas multipétalas e etc tá então é isso eu quero pedir né carinhosamente para que você deixe o like aqui no vídeo Tá? Deixa o like, não esquece, deixa o like, se inscreva, você que ainda não é inscrito no canal, que sempre tá aqui assistindo e você sempre se esquece de se inscrever, se inscreve aí, tá? E aí, para você que já é de casa, aquela pessoa que já assiste todos os vídeos e tudo, seja membro do canal, você vai receber um mundo de vantagens, você já é de casa, você vai entrar lá no grupo VIP dos membros, tá? Então seja membro, clica aqui, ó, seja membro, tá? Vai ajudar o canal e o canal vai te ajudar, tá bom? Então é isso, com vocês, uma palestra, olha bem, é uma palestra do Mark Dimit falando sobre a história das rosas do deserto. Comecinho, quando foram aparecendo as primeiras rosas do deserto diferentes, as vermelhas, as brancas, né? Vamos dar uma olhadinha. Fiquem com o Mark Dimit aí. Grande abraço. We'll talk about a plant that I've been obsessed with since 1967, which is when I found the first adenium. Um, the, the, your brochure says the title is the adenium, so that covers a lot of ground. This is almost entirely uh, a talk about the development of adenium in horticulture. And uh, I like this story because it's one of the very few plants for which we have a nearly complete story of how it got into horticulture and who was involved in it. And uh, it involves quite a few people, several of the names you will recognize, and a couple of them are even in this room. 
diem as uh, colloquially speaking, uh, I've been saying this for years and nobody is arguing with me yet. I consider a diem to be the only succulent plant that is both a really beautiful plant and has large colorful flowers over a long flowering season. Botanically speaking, it's a member of the dogbane family, Apocinaceae, along with other succulents like Pachypodium, Plumeria, uh, and non-succulents like Oleander and Madagascar Pera, and quite a few other plants. And the milkweed family is, has been sunk into Apocinaceae, so uh, milkweeds are now pretty closely related to these. There are only 10 or 11 taxa of Adeniums. Uh, I'm, I'm going to use mostly the term taxa. Singular taxon is, it means a category. And it's, uh, it can be a category anywhere from a kingdom all the way down to species, subspecies, cultivars. I'm using taxon because we still don't know whether these entities are full species, subspecies, or maybe even just forms. I'll say a little bit more about that later. But at any rate, they're scattered throughout the semi-arid parts of Africa and the southern fringe of the Saudi Arabia Peninsula. There's a little brown stripe there right on the coast of Saudi Arabia, Yemen. And there's a, a species in Dofar, too. Uh, 10 or 11 taxa. They're the, the ones in cultivation, at least, are quite distinct. Uh, when, when I see one in cultivation, I can almost always distinguish what species I think it is, which, which taxon it is. But in the wild, it's a lot more complicated, as you saw Chuck showed a picture in his show, and I wouldn't commit to what it was. I wouldn't even take a wild guess. Well, I, I would take a wild guess, but what's the point in that? <laughs> uh, let's run quickly through the species so you can see how diverse they are. The, the taxa, I so need to keep calling them taxa. Um, to, I'm going to start in southern Africa and move northward. Uh, Dedium oleifolium is a dwarf species with an underground caudex. Very small flowers, usually about an inch across. The ones in cultivation are all pink flower, as far as I've seen. But in the wild, there's at least one population that has highly variable flower color. And I understand this population has been wiped out by an airport. So all of our crop plants are, are in jeopardy, it appears. Adenium swazicum is a somewhat larger shrub, uh, mostly endemic to Swaziland. It's, uh, the, the specimen shown is the only one I could find at the time, uh, sent to me by by a fellow I barely know. Um, it, it, this is shorter than usual because it grows in grassland and had recently burned. It gets burned to the ground every few years. And it's also grazed by impalas. In cultivation, it could grow two or three feet tall. And again, it has an underground caudex, which you can raise if you want to in cultivation, but you don't see that in, in the wild. Adenium bloomianum is the first one going north that I think is a, is a really nice specimen. Most of them, in fact, and most populations are really scrawny sticks with flowers on the end. But when you get to the northern end of its range, uh, they develop into pretty nice caudiciforms. And they can get to six to eight feet tall with uh, an age. I have no idea how old that plant is. Uh, Swazicum and Bomianum are recognized by their flowers, which have solid colored petals. That is, they do not fade from the edge toward the center, like almost all the other ones do. And both of those species have dark throats. Adenium multiflorum um, occurs uh, mostly in, in, uh, in Botswana and Mozambique. Uh, this was taken in Kruger National Park near the southern end of its range. That's an unusually large specimen of the ones I saw in Kruger. They're mostly scrawny little shrubs in the understory. I think they're, they're heavily trampled by large grazing animals. But uh, it, it's uh, the only really winter-blooming adenium. It drops its leaves in the fall and it flowers when it's leafless in the winter. And the flowers are pretty distinctive. They're white with a sharp red edge. Adenium obesum. Um, this and one of the other taxa are, uh, I, I put in quotes, because they're illegitimate names. What we call Adenium obesum is not, and it, uh, may, maybe I'll get time to talk about that a little bit later. But uh, this species, this taxon, occurs um, across the Sahel region, uh, below the Sahara Desert, and into East Africa, into uh, Kenya and Tanzania. It's mostly a shrub. It can be a very low-growing shrub, only a foot or two tall. Or when it grows on rocks, it can be uh, a few feet tall. 
if it's in soil, the, ta the caudex again is underground, and it has one of the smaller caudexes of all the species. Uh, but you can see in the lower right there that some of them have very large caudexes, but again, they're, they're underground in the wild. The flowers are almost always pink, especially the ones that originally were in cultivation. And like most adeniums, the color is darkest on the petal edge, and it fades to white at the throat. And uh, in this taxon, the throat can be either plain or it can have strong nectar guides. Uh, there's just a couple of nectar guides on the reddish flower on the left. Adenium somalensi can be a really large plant with a, a conical trunk up to six to eight feet tall, maybe a little more. The one on the right is taller than that. The plant growing around it is a sansevieria with six foot tall leaves. So that, that's a really big plant. I think that's much larger than average. When it grows on rocks, it has this tall conical trunk. But when it grows in sandy soils and valley bottoms, it's only a couple of feet tall with an underground caudex. So it's a highly variable taxon, as apparently some of the other ones are too. The flowers are uh, widely variable in color. The ones in cultivation are mostly red at the edge and fading toward a, a whitish throat. This is an unusually dark colored flower. The ones in cultivation, at least the ones I've seen, are not very good bloomers, but uh, obviously from this picture, they can bloom heavily. Maybe I just have had some pretty crummy clones. Adenium crispum is a, another dwarf species, really over a foot tall, with an underground caudex. This is a collected plant, and the soil level would have been here, so all this would have been underground. Uh, it grows uh, near the coast in Somalia, and the flowers are, are very small, usually only about an inch across. The petals are quilled, which means they're curled, and so they appear to be pointed at the tip. And it's the only taxon that has strong striping all the way to the edge of the petals. And that will turn out to be important. And this particular plant will also be important later on in the history of this, of this development. Adenium arabicum, I think, is my favorite taxon. It occurs in Saudi Arabia and Yemen. It's highly variable in growth form. It, it varies from a, a, a squat caudex uh, up to several feet in diameter, or it can be a conical trunk tree. And I, it, it appears to be more or less genetic, or pretty strongly genetic from the ones I've grown in cultivation. The flowers are usually small and almost always pink. And again, they're darkest at the edges and fade toward the throat, which can be either plain white or yellow, or it can have strong nectar guides. Adenium doforensi was described only a couple of years ago by Elaine Respecki in, in our journal. Um, it occurs uh, in the Dofar region of Oman, almost exclusively in Oman. I understand there is a population or two in, uh, in Yemen. Most of the plants, all the plants are caudiciform with more or less globular caudexes. The uh, stems of most populations are very floppy. They bend down to the ground, and when they do, they root and form new plants. I think it's the only taxon that does that. There's at least one population with erect stems. The leaves are huge, the biggest in the genus. Uh, during the, the summer monsoon season, it doesn't rain very much, but it's a bathed in mist for about three months. So it has these gigantic leaves that are about five inches long, maybe three inches wide. The flowers are small, about an inch and a half across, and usually pink. Uh, that flower is much darker than the ones I've seen in cultivation. And this is the island giant, endemic to Socotra Island. The trunk is known to get up to eight feet or more in diameter. And uh, it can be either squat like the one on the right, or it can be a big conical tree. And uh, I've seen a lot of pictures taken by, by various people, including uh, the webs. And uh, some of the seedlings look like very scrawny sticks. And some of the seedlings I've grown are sticks. So they don't all grow into these monstrous specimens. They've been selected in cultivation for, uh, for the, the biggest ones. It's probably the slowest growing species. It takes a long time to reach flowering size and even longer time to reach a fat specimen. And uh, I'm not terribly interested in it because it's one that's very slow and because it has pink flowers, which I've never been fond of. More on that later. Um, DNA analysis has finally been done. And uh, the preliminary, preliminary results indicate that in southern Africa, these three species, uh, Swazicum, Oleofolium, and Bomianum, are good, distinct species. 
And then this group of three up here, the uh, Arabicum, Doforensi, and Somalensi, uh, Socotronum on the island, are very closely related. And it's not clear from the preliminary results whether they should be different species. And then this great big group who goes across the Sahel and the East Africa and all the way down to include multiflora, those are all extremely closely related and difficult to separate, at least with the loci that, that were analyzed. This is the first tree that was generated um, using five loci, all of the plastids, a couple of chloroplast and a couple of uh, uh, mitochondrial DNA samples. The nuclear DNA gave um, a tree that looked like a pile of spaghetti, so it wasn't used. But the, the five loci that were used to generate this tree were all agreed very, very closely with one another. Now, this looks like a pretty pretty distinctive tree, but it's, it's been greatly exaggerated. Um, the outgroup, Pachypodium, looks like it's fairly distinct, but even these are quite close together. And uh, this was done by a, a zoologist who's not familiar with botany, but he said if these were tortoises, they, these would all be one species. <laughs> and because within these groups, they're so close together, the differences among them were less than one half of 1%. And mm -hmm. at least in the animals, they, they, they want to see about a 2% difference to say it, it might be a valid species. Um, I'll put a, a request right now. I, I want to continue work on this. I want to collaborate with a plant geneticist to help sort this out further. If anybody wants to work on adeniums, the, the data are available and the DNA has been preserved, so any more sequencing can be done if anybody wants to do that. <clears throat> but looking at the photographs, you can see there's a lot of diversity to work with for a hybridizer. And I find it puzzling that uh, the adeniums have not been known in cultivation until quite recently. One possible reason is that when they were available in the 1960s and 70s, most people considered them to be very delicate, difficult to grow. And from my standpoint, the flowers were mostly pink. Uh, you, you, if you don't know me, you'll realize very quickly that I have no use for pastels. <laughs> my motto that's been attributed to me is if it isn't red, it's dead. <laughs> I think it's the newest ornamental plant to be brought into a domestication. Um, wheat and potatoes were domesticated thousands of years ago. Tomatoes were cultivated for more than 2,500 years, but hybridization began 200 years ago, which is fairly recent, but still it's a, a pretty good, pretty good length of time for, for developing the tomatoes you see from the little cherry-sized things, or pea-sized things, really, from the wild tomatoes. Roses and chrysanthemums, thousands of years. They go way back, mostly in China. Snapdragons since Roman times. And getting up to Echinopsis hybridization, one of the more recent things to be domesticated. Um, as far as I can tell, hybridization began in the 1950s with the Johnsons of Paramount Cactus Farm. So Adini was almost unknown in cultivation before about 1980. Commercial production began in the late 1980s. Serious breeding has been underway only since the late 1990s, but now their population, their, their popularity is, uh, is, is exploding and still growing rapidly. How many of you are familiar with this book? Probably most of you older people. This, this was, uh, I, don't, I, don't think you, I don't think you'd find it anymore. Uh, well, it, I did. It, it's on Amazon now for $25. It used to be hugely expensive, so very few people actually owned one. But if, if you had a friend who had one or if you went to the library, this was an encyclopedia. This was first published in 1957. I think the last edition was about 1990 as, as Tropica. But the, the version I used was published in the mid-1970s. That version, Exotica 3, had 16,000 photographs of virtually every tropical plant that was known in cultivation. Adenium was not in here. So at that time, I, I had seen a plant and I finally acquired a couple of plants from Grigsby Cactus Gardens, and I wanted to know more about it. And I couldn't learn anything about it. You, you couldn't go on Google and say, tell me about adeniums. And it wasn't in here, so what, what could you do? You just had to find people who had grown them, and that was by snail mail more often than not. It was difficult to learn about these. That's changing. OK, starting the history. As far as I can tell, this is the oldest clone of Adenium that's in cultivation. I got it from Ashish Hansudi, 
who has a big nursery in India. You will learn about more about him later. Uh, I named it Hansodi Dwarf after I learned about its, its, its horticultural value. He got it from a fellow who had had it in cultivation since at least 1950. So it's a, a pretty old plant. The plant on the right is a 10-year-old cutting that I got from Ashish. I have two lines of evidence that indicate very strongly that this plant originated um, in, uh, on Jabal Shamsan, which is behind the port of Aden. A little aside, uh, how many of you have seen this movie, The Big Boss? Uh, some of you have. This was Bruce Lee's breakout movie. It's one of the first in the genre of uh, martial arts movies. Um, I thought it kind of lame, but it, it follows the formula that most of them do. But anyway, it, it, the movie ends with you know, bodies strewn all over the landscape. But being a plant geek, what I noticed is that the, this is the same as landscape with potted adeniums in 1971. Forget about all the people and the fighting and all that. There's, there's my plant there. Um, there, there were some uh, quicker, very fuzzy blow-bys in the movie that showed me they, these are all apparently the same clone, grown from cuttings. Uh, they're pretty scrawny plants with pale pink flowers, typical of what we knew about in the 19... 1970s. This was filmed in Thailand. Okay, this is Ashish Hansodi. He's an avid plant collector and owns a huge nursery near Mumbai, also known as Bombay, formerly known as Bombay. Um, and he's, he's, a, he's like many of us, a, a, an obsessive collector. And he's very much into Adeniums, one of his favorite plants. This big commercial greenhouse is devoted to all of the adeniums that he collected in the 1980s. Look at all that wonderful diversity. <laughs> I look at that and I wonder, how did I ever get hooked on these plants? They're pink. <clears throat> this is one of my plants, one of the first ones to mature. Uh, a typical adenium obesum in quotes, a legitimate name, remember. Um, a poor codex for the most part in that taxon. Um, this is more upright, more sturdy than most. It has pink flowers fading toward the center, and only for a couple of months a year. Um, I was actually fairly excited about this because it was darker pink than average, and I thought, you know, maybe if I cross it, I could get some better colors out of it. This was my collection in 1978, not at all very impressive by today's standards, but I crossed these back and forth, and uh, that kind of began at least my history of development as a serious Adenium breeder. Um, in this history, I'm using two terms, milestones and breakthroughs. A milestone is a significant event, at least to me, in the development of the, uh, of the cultivars. And a breakthrough is something that uh, had a worldwide impact on the domestication of Adeniums. I think the first milestone was started in the mid-1970s when the first named cultivar was introduced. A nurseryman named Albert Chan brought into cultivation in Singapore and soon distributed it all over the world. Um, this is kind of a mystery because he said that he got it from Saudi Arabia, and this is definitely not an Arabian plant. It appears to be an Adenium obesum, in quotes again. Um, its distinguishing character is that one, it develops a better caudex eventually than many um, obesums do. And it had huge flowers, up to four inches across, which is more than twice the size of the average adenium flower. I have bred my adeniums for about three generations, and one day I came up with, with this flower, which absolutely, uh, um, I was ecstatic when it flowered. It not only did it have good red edges, uh, it bloomed year round. So I named it Red Everbloomer. Uh, today, uh, 35 years later, this is garbage. <laughs> so keep that in mind. But this was this, this was what got me started to say I can do something with these plants. Another milestone was when I acquired my first swazicums and uh, realized that I could cross different species. Uh, Perpetual pink is a plant that I got from Grigsby, and uh, swazicum Boyce Thompson I got from the Boyce Thompson Arboretum. They had one plant in their collection which had really dark purple flowers, much darker than the average for that. And as it turns out, Swazicum contributes dark flower color to its offspring. So I crossed, 
Red Ever Bloomer with Boyce Thompson, and one of the seedlings turned out to be a brilliant red flowered hybrid that I named Crimson Star in 1985. This in turn led to a breakthrough. In 1990, Huntington Botanical Gardens introduced Crimson Star through its International Succulent Introductions Program, and some plants made their way to Thailand. That is significant for a couple of reasons. Two other things contributed to the, this big breakthrough. At about the time I was producing Crimson Star, unbeknownst to me for many years, um, Jake Henney, a professor in Florida, was also hybridizing adeniums, and he crossed the same two species and got a brilliant pink that he called Calypso. And a few years later, the first white adenium obesum appeared in, in cultivation. It was discovered in the wild in Kenya by a fellow named Ken Olton, which most people won't know because he was apparently rather reclusive. But a fellow named Tom Grumbly got a cutting and had it in his garden. And Tom was a very gregarious person, and he shared cuttings with everybody who wanted one. And Seymour Linden was the first one, as far as I know, who imported it to the United States, and I got a cutting from him. And about the same time, a very uh, an identical-looking white appeared in Thailand. Uh, probably the same one. Uh, it was called Ina White. And in Rowley's book, um, Pachypodium and Adenium, he, he named it Snowbell. They're all the same thing, I'm pretty sure. So why are these breakthroughs? It was the first time people realized that Adeniums could be had in colors other than pink. This is especially important in Asia, where red is a, an important cultural color. It means just about everything good. Riches, good health, longevity, all that, all that good stuff. And it's especially important in Thailand because the Thais are absolutely nuts about growing plants. This, this is an apartment complex. They're not required to grow plants here, but every balcony is festooned with flowers. This is a common sight in Bangkok and probably the rest of Thailand, for all I know. The Thais are into horticulture the way we Americans are into football. That is not an exaggeration. If you like gardening, you've got to go to Bangkok. I visited Thailand in 2000, and by that time, 10 years after the introduction of Crimson Star and the other ones, um, John Lucas and I visited there together. We visited, oh, dozens of succulent nurseries. Every single one of them had adeniums. Every single one of them had Crimson Star and Calypso and Grumbly White. And they were already doing some hybridization, although that's definitely not the center of hybridization. A milestone in the United States, and maybe in Asia too, was in about 1995, this beautiful plant was discovered in a nursery by Jim Georgesis. He's mostly known for breeding the euphorbias and uh, shrubby euphorbias and uh, bromeliads, but he dabbled in adeniums too. Uh, he gave this plant to, to John Lucas, who spread it all around. It was the first obesum that had really, really good red flowers. By the late 1990s, there were lots of beautiful reds in ta Taiwan. Almost all the adenium breeding, at least 90% of it, is taking place in Taiwan. And uh, th th these are generically called Taiwan reds with many different cultivar names. They're pretty easily recognizable. They're, they're very densely uh, branched shrubs with lots of big red solid colored flowers and especially big shiny green leaves. They're pretty highly recognizable. And possibly Black Ruby was the founder of this line, or it was uh, an offshoot of this line that got to the United States somehow. We don't know how that happened, but these are all very similar and obviously closely related. Mass production began only in 1996 by this fellow, Lion Fa. Um, you'll see him later in one of his nurseries, but uh, it needs to say that, that we don't know what Dedenium production is here. In Taiwan, it's, it's big business. A huge breakthrough for me and in Asia happened in 1999. I got a, a letter in the mail one day. We, we did this is way before email. We got a letter in the mail. Uh, it said, my, my name is Tony Wong. I live in Taiwan. I want to trade adenes with you. So I wrote it back. Yeah, that sounds like a great idea. Let's do it. A few weeks later, I got a phone call. And this voice on the phone said, this is Tony. I'm at the airport. Can you pick me up? <laughs> Okay, 
talk to you right there. Took a day off work, went to meet him. Um, first thing I found out is that Tony speaks no English. I speak no Chinese. What do you do about that? He had he had a version 1.0 electronic translator. And we quickly realized this is not going to work. Have you ever used Google Translate? Well, this was a lot worse. <laughs> So I had the brilliant idea. We went to lunch at a Chinese restaurant and we badgered the waiter to translate for us for a few minutes. <laughs> so we, we figured out what each of us wanted. We went to my house and we traded cuttings and he went home the next day. I never saw him again. At the same time, about the same time, um, the internet was, email was coming along. Not the internet really, but the email was coming along. I made a contact with Ming Wei Chen was a journalist who, doc, who had been documenting the development of Adenium in Asia. He was an avid collector, and being a journalist, he liked to record things. So most of the information you're getting came from Ming Wei Chen and from Ashish Hansodi, who was also a, a very good recorder of, of, uh, of information. But one of the plants that I got from, from Tony Wong was this plant that's called Home Run. It was the best of the Taiwan Reds, and I think even today, more than 30 years later, it is uh, it's the finest red flowered abesum or even adenium that I know of. It's still an excellent plant, uh, excellent flower. The plant is, has some drawbacks, but it's a gorgeous plant. These are all the same clone under different conditions, uh, weather conditions, it changes, but they're always a beautiful red, usually with a black edge. Far more important was the plant, one of the plants that I sent to Taiwan. All right, remember this plant? This is a collected plant of adenium crispum. Uh, collected by uh, Seymour Linden and um, um, I'm blank, and Jerry Barat in Somalia in 1985. There's a couple of names you should all know. Uh, Chuck Hansen acquired his plant and grew seedlings from it. I bought this seedling from him, which I named uh, number 106. It is better than the average for having really good striping on the petals. This is a very difficult plant to grow in humid climates. So it, it soon died in Taiwan but not before they managed to hybridize it with other plants. The most important characteristic is that this is the only taxon that has good striping on the petals. And several, apparently several Taiwanese breeders got this plant and put it into their, into their breeding programs. So within three generations, one of them had produced a plant they named Harry Potter in 2003. This is the first adenium that had strong markings on the petals and flat petals. They got rid of the quilling of the Adenium crispum. And it's quite floriferous. I still have a plant. It's still, still a pretty nice plant. But what they've done with it since then, uh, you'll see later, is just is truly astounding. This is Mr. Chong, who's the creator of Harry Potter. He's widely regarded as the best Adenium breeder in the world. And having seen some of his plants, I, I wouldn't argue with that at all. Another milestone happened in the early 2000s in in uh, Thailand, I, I keep confusing Taiwan and Thailand, not geographically, but my, my tongue gets tied. In Thailand, they're not doing a lot of, of breeding. They mostly buy the best cultivars from Taiwan and then propagate them by the thousands and distribute them all over the world. But one thing they are breeding avidly is dwarf Adenium arabicums. I don't know where they originated, but these plants rarely get over two feet by two feet in 10 years. And unfortunately, they call them Thai Socotronums. They have nothing to do with Adenium Socotronum. They are dwarf strains of Adenium Arabicum, which is also an illegitimate name. I want to keep pointing that out because the taxonomy is going to make you mad when it finally comes out. <laughs> uh, Tiny Ding Dong is only about six inches tall. It's full grown. It's, it's a, actually, it's, I think it's genetically defective. It doesn't like to grow at all, but they, they like those weird things. <laughs> Another milestone um, was created by Miles Anderson. About 1998, he was the first one to be able to cross Adenium arabicum with Adenium crispum. Adenium arabicum is a tetraploid taxon, and it does not like to cross with any other Adenium. Um, you probably know about seedless watermelons. If you cross a tetraploid watermelon with a diploid watermelon, you get sterile triploid hybrids that can't make seeds. So at least not viable seeds, so they don't have any seeds in them. That's what should happen with adeniums. 
But uh, once in a while, something happens and you get a viable seat out of it. And Miles accomplished that. I've never been able to cross the two taxa. But he got this, um, a, a group of plants that he called his cross number 10. This is a mature plant of that. It's known by having a, a fairly small plant with a relatively huge caudex, nice sturdy stems. The flowers are not what I would call interesting at all, but at least they have potential. Uh, with further breeding, the petals got whiter and flatter and more strongly colored, etc. And as far as I know, I'm the first and only person to cross Adenium arabicum with Adenium obesum. Again, they don't like to cross. I made of scores and scores of, of pollinations and usually got pods that dropped off and finally one pod produced one viable seed and it grew it had hybrid vigor it grew into a monster plant this this is a 36 inch pot and that the codex is more than two feet in diameter at 10 years of age it has huge three and a half inch flowers that are born year-round not in great quantities and they're a nice light red color so it's getting pretty close to what I would like in a DDM, although it has no commercial value at that size. There are, I have a lot of them now. It's the main, the second main hybrid line that I work with. Uh, beautiful codexes, many of them have red flowers. They will flower either with or without leaves, and some of them flower almost year round. Uh, two of the hybrids from this line are Number 403, which I have named Red Giant. It's a very large plant, it's six feet high in eight or ten years, with very nice dark red flowers. And Adenium bouquet, which is mainly known to me because it has uh, a higher flower count than most. Uh, a little more about that later if I have time. But this has up to 45 flowers in an inflorescence. So when that plant begins to bloom, that inflorescence will be in bloom for two to four months. Yes, uh-huh. Why did it say um, I looked for the graft and I couldn't find it. I don't know if I grafted that plant or not. I didn't grow up to that, to that stage. The the, the... The yeah, I looked up there and I, I couldn't see them. They're, they're, they're perfect grafts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a beautifully grown plant. Um, the milestone that I am most pleased with is that I crossed the Adenium obesum hybrids, uh, Arabicum obesum hybrids with the Arabicum chrysum hybrids to get three species in the mix. The result of that is the, the best of all fields as far as I'm concerned. The plants have big codexes. I haven't photographed my mature plants yet, I just realized when I was putting this together. These are still seedlings, so the codexes haven't grown, but they get really big. They're medium-sized plants from two to four feet high, which you can stunt more by keeping them pot-bound. They flower over a very long season with nice round flowers that can be anywhere from, from dark pink to bright red, and some of them are showing chrysum stripes. And they're, they're pretty disease resistant. They've got a lot of heterozygosity in them, and they tolerate a lot of different growing conditions. And um, I'd like to call this a breakthrough. I hope it is. This is the first Adenium book published in the English language, the first one at least completely devoted to Adeniums. By, uh, by Jean Joseph, Dave Paul Skill, and myself. That's the basic history. I want to complete the talk by showing you where Adeniums are today and where I hope they will go in the near future. I'm going to go through these very quickly um, and not talk about them. I just want you to see what kinds of flowers are available. I didn't do the plants. Uh, dwarf plants, there are, these, these are called Taiwan minis. Uh, Laio Fa. Uh, develop this line. That's a uh, that's a, a 12 month old plant from a seed, and uh, that's saleable. He's uh, selling these all over Asia, as uh, and basically as, as annuals. They go into the market. People buy them. They're they're like you would buy pansies or or, or orchid Trader Joe's orchids. You grow them for a few months. They stop flowering. They throw them out. Buy another one. Uh, that's not what I want to do. But th that's a big commercial market. Uh, this is Lyon Fa's nursery, a small part of it. He has um, 11 hectares of adeniums. That's about 23, 25 acres in Taiwan, and he says an equal number of acres in mainland China. And he is one of a dozen or so major growers in Taiwan. And there are also huge nurseries in Indonesia, and uh, then Ashish Hansodi's nursery in, in Mumbai, which is truly gigantic. These are just some of them. 
I was there with Kevin Barber, many of you know him. There's an unbelievable number of plants. I looked at every one of them when I was shopping. I must have seen, I must have seen a couple of million plants to choose from. <clears throat> this is Tropica Nursery, which is Ashish's in India. He's got a number of beautiful hybrids, some of them his own, some from tai Taiwan. He shops there a couple of times a year. This is what his nursery looked like in 2008, the last time I was there. Uh, compare that with what he had in 2000 and uh, 1980. That's, that's where they've come in that length of time. Uh, I won't tell you about the species, I just want to show you what flower shapes and sizes are available. I think the reds have reached perfection as far as the flowers go. The plants could be improved somewhat. Great general is four inches across. Picatees, beautiful, beautiful Picatees now. Weird ones, uh, these two, well, the left one is a chimera. It throws red and pink flowers, sometimes variegated flowers. One on the right changes color as it ages very strongly. There are a number of doubles that are getting very popular now. I'm very sorry to see that. I think they're absolutely horrible. Not the flowers themselves, but the, they're breeding only for the flower, and the plants are absolute crud. The stems are very thin and weak. The flowers usually hang upside down. They can't support the, the weight. And I, I think they came along much too early in the breeding process. And somebody needs to take these and start breeding for plant quality. Taiwan dwarfs again. Oh, the, that one on the left is, uh, that's genetically messed up. They, they just do not grow. But there's one fellow who's growing hundreds of these because he thinks they're really cool. Uh, these are Taiwan dwarfs grafted on the standard sized adeniums. Uh, so what you get then is a little tiny bush at the end of each branch with massive flower. <clears throat> Picatees are bicolors I really, really love, but they don't sell very well in, in my climate, in my area. But uh, there are some really gorgeous bicolors. People admire them, but they don't buy them from me. Taiwan Beauty, I think it's still around. It's a really, really nice one. Very floriferous. Usually, Swazica and some hybrids have solid color flowers. A few of them have white stars at the base, which really sets off the color. National Beauty is almost purple. I haven't seen any really good purples yet. I think Miss Venezuela is a Bomiana hybrid. I have a number of bony atom hybrids with crispum, and crispum is dominant. I don't get the big leaves, and I, uh, I don't get big round flowers like that. But that that's, a, that's a very large flower, three and a half inches. I don't know if it's got made its way out of Venezuela. It was bred by David Kulo, who lives there, and people are not going to Venezuela these days. It's not a pleasant place to be, I hear. And that's probably the most beautiful shaped white flowered one. Uh, just take a look at the varieties that have been bred from that one plant that went to Taiwan. All of these stripes come from that one crispum, and the blotches too. I saw the first yellow flowered ones when I was in Thailand in 2000. I have not seen any improvement since. I've seen beautiful pictures online, but every, every one I've seen in person is straw color, and I think they've all been photoshopped. Has anybody seen a bright lemon yellow adenium? Yeah, I haven't either. I presume they're coming. Well, see that one called yellow on the lower left? Those leaves are not the right color. That's been photoshopped. Um, something about flowering. Uh, abundance, which you can't see in most photographs. Um, the next chart is a, the next chart, slide is a, a big blow up of this. Uh, I keep flowering phonology. I call this a flowering level one. The plant's in bloom, but not particularly showy. Flowering level three is a plant that's in full bloom and very nice to look at. And flowering level five is uh, completely covered with flowers. The foliage is essentially hidden. And these, these levels here are an average over a month, so none of them reach five for an entire month so far. But this is a comparison of how they've, 
how they've been domesticated. The, this, these are uh, an average of a number of wild type Adenium obesums, and anything above the dark gray area is considered full bloom. Um, most of these things are in full bloom for only about two months. They're really nice showy plants. But look at some of the better hybrids. They're in full glorious bloom for eight months a year, eight or nine months. So that, that's a major improvement. Uh, I'll skip that one. So some of the future goals that several people are working on, especially Ashish, uh, higher flower count. Almost all wild adeniums, at least the ones that I have in my collection, the standard number of flowers per inflorescence is five. Um, some of them are as low as one or two in the dwarf arabicums. And wild plants, I've never seen one with more than uh, maybe eight or nine flowers, except for Adenium bomiana, which is in, has indeterminate inflorescences. It'll bloom for a long time on one, one inflorescence. Uh, this Adenium arabicum has more than 50 flowers in an inflorescence. Not all at once, obviously. It blooms for months at a time. Um, another highly desirable characteristic would be if they flowered frequently. This one flowers about every third leaf. That would be highly desirable. Um, I don't have any to do that well yet. Um, more compact plants. That's not something that's desirable to me. I like big plants. Especially, I like my plants, my flowers up here at eye level because I don't like to bend over anymore. <laughs> but most people can't grow the giant things like, like this one in the corner over here. They don't, they don't have the strength or the place to put them in the winter. Uh, so the smaller plants are commercially valuable. I'm not paying much attention to that, but most people should if they want to make money. And another uh, obviously desirable goal would be to get bolder colors. This one has a beautiful yellow throat. I have given up on that line because uh, I've bred three or four generations of these, and the yellow is just so recessive that I never get any improvements. And this is really nice, uh, a nice uh, Chrisfum hybrid uh, with a bright white background and very strong red markings. And that's very hard to get because the, the, usually they have pink backgrounds. So between the 1970s and today, you can see that deniums have come a very long way. And we have a pretty good idea of, of who was involved in doing that. And consider the rate of development is one more fact. Almost all the cultivars I've shown you are no longer available. They've been relegated to the trash heap and replaced by better cultivars. This happens every few years. So don't try to look for the cultivars that are in the Adenium book. Most of them are, they're gone. I want to acknowledge particularly uh, Ashi Shansodi and Ming Wei Chen. Most of the information I gave you came from them. They are really uh, astute observers and good recorders of information. And uh, I need to thank J.S. Lin, who was my guide in, uh, in Taiwan. None of the Adenium breeders speak English. He is a bilingual uh, nurseryman in northern uh, Taiwan and a very generous fellow. He drove Kevin and I all over the island to all the nurseries and treated us uh, royally. And then Chandra Handardo is a huge nursery in Indonesia, uh, has been very helpful too. Então, pessoal, muito massa, né? Uma palestra dessa é é para você assistir de novo, tá? É pra você assistir de novo, você volta e assiste de novo. Outro dia, agora não, mas outro dia você vai assistir de novo pra você entender, tá? Então assista quantas vezes for necessário aí pra vocês entenderem, tá bom? Quero agradecer imensamente agora a Deus, tá? Como eu sempre eu termino meus vídeos assim, fazendo uma oração de agradecimento, tá? Eu quero que todos vocês aí de casa também entrem nessa mesma sintonia, nessa mesma vibe, nessa mesma energia de agradecimento, de coração cheio de gratitude, cheio de gratidão, né? cheio de graça. Obrigado, Senhor, por mais um dia de vida, por essa vida maravilhosa. Obrigado, meu Pai, por eu poder enxergar, por eu poder pensar, por eu poder ouvir, por eu poder falar. Obrigado, Senhor, por eu poder andar, por eu poder respirar. Obrigado, obrigado pelo pão de cada dia, pela casa, pela minha família, pelo meu trabalho. Obrigado, Senhor, obrigado que abençoe todos esses que ficaram até aqui nesse vídeo assistindo, abençoa a casa dele, Senhor, abençoa, abençoa a família, abençoa as plantinhas, abençoa a casa de todos que estão assistindo. 
Muito obrigado a vocês que fazem o canal Lodo Júnior Rosa do Deserto crescer a cada dia mais. E sempre eu vou trazer novidades para vocês. Um grande abraço.